Reading 58 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Uspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nichol. Volume 3. Great Amel House, December 21st, 1946. On Finding Solutions. On one occasion, Mr. Uspinsky was speaking of someone whom he described as a violent, just man. He said in so many words, he believes that there are final solutions for everything. This makes him violent. He does not realize that everything is turning and changing, that man cannot do, and that there are no final solutions. If there were, life would cease to be life. It would be death. You must understand that life is a perpetual motion machine. The same problems come round again and again, and people try to solve them to find final solutions to them, and no one can. How could they? We have to realize that the main life problems are insoluble. There is only one solution to all problems, and that is change of attitude. I said to him, You mean that one must always start from oneself? He said, Yes, because you cannot change life, so why start from life? from the other person and seek first to change him but you can change yourself and so change your reactions to life change of attitude changes the way life touches you attitudes connect us with outer things and make them important or unimportant according to the kinds of attitudes we have been taught so we get bound to unimportant things and take them as important as if they were our whole life and things that are really important we neglect. In this connection it is clear that Mr. Uspinsky emphasized what the work means for a person who has begun to understand its direction and import. One has to start with oneself. It is this oneself that has to be changed. The work is not about outer but about inner things, things in oneself, and therefore it begins with self-observation. In beginning with self-observation, it lays its stress on you, on what you are like. Life from the teaching of the work is a vast internet machinery in which everything happens, so it removes all emphasis from life, from what happens, from how people behave to you, and lays the emphasis on what kind of person you are and how you take things. Now, as regards this thing called you, it teaches that it is a mass of acquired associations and buffers, a mass of acquired attitudes, and so of acquired mechanical reactions to life. These attitudes, these reactions, can be changed. You need not react in your typical way. You need not feel depressed negative or violent as you ordinarily do. It is your psychological machinery that makes you do so. Life need not have the ever recurring same effect upon you that it habitually has and that you take for granted as right. The habits of taking life as you do are because you have a locally acquired stamped machinery. But you can realize your mechanicalness and have eventually sudden flashes of insight whereby you realize how you are always taking things mechanically and need not do so. Then you begin to see what the work is about, self-change. The truth is that people do not see what personality means. It means the acquired side of yourself and it is this that has to be made passive, namely this mechanical way of taking life, people, and yourself. This is certainly a great truth that few can meet successfully, being so convinced of their own tightness in all things. When a new person is brought into this work, I first of all think, can this person ever see himself or herself and begin to work on themselves? Or are they crystallized in life, in their attitudes, and in their estimate of themselves? One notices how they talk, 
One encourages them to talk as they habitually do, and then eventually one can tell either that they will never be able to separate themselves from what life has made them, or that they might to a slight extent, or that they might even go further and actually begin to change their being. Now, if a man cannot possibly see himself, if he is so glued to himself that he cannot observe what he is glued to, then he cannot do this work internally. Although he may do sufficiently externally, if he has being on the level of good householder to work externally, that is, serve the work in its outer discipline. And a person who does this faithfully may be given gradually by the power of the work in measure that will not injure him the beginning of insight into what he has hitherto taken as himself. I say gradually because a man without inner life if he were to be suddenly detached from all he values and prides himself on, would be completely smashed, having his foundations in life and having nothing else. He would collapse under the vision of a higher level of himself and another order of things. Now, to come back to this question of finding solutions. The work teaches that the solution of things lies ultimately only in yourself, in how you take things. Let us take the question of liking and disliking that many do not understand yet. First you are told in the second line of work, that is, in relation to others, that you have to start with yourself and stop disliking. As was pointed out, this can be done. How? By noticing where the impression of a person whom you mechanically dislike tends to fall on centers and not identifying with it. Yes, it enters and stimulates its typical reaction. But if you know anything about self-observation, you already have a space of time in you, a pause, before the impression can get fully into the centers and have its full mechanical effect. Self-observation opens a little room, a little space, and time between the incoming impression and its lodgment in the place that habitually receives it and reacts to it. Self-observation begins to make an inner life in a man. Eventually, he undergoes a growth of consciousness in this way, namely, that consciousness begins to intervene between the impression and the reaction. The man himself begins to stand between outer life coming in as impressions and his psychological machinery lying in eyes and rolls on centers. He intervenes. He then begins to take life, that is, impressions, consciously, so he can stop dislike. And so, often, the solution lies just in this, to stop mechanical disliking. The next point is that when you have this pause in you, this momentary consciousness in a new place, you can begin even to like what you dislike. As was said, if you can stop mechanical disliking, the common source of loss of force and negativeness, by catching the impression of the disliked person before it fully engages the acquired machine you take as yourself, then this work on yourself will lead you to the possibility of sounding the next note in this octave, namely of beginning to like what hitherto you so easily, so continually, so unchangeably, so automatically disliked. One must shift oneself from what one is, and if you continue to dislike mechanically, you cannot shift yourself. All mechanical reactions to life, to others, keep you exactly where you are. Remember, work on yourself must be accompanied by work in regard to others. Work means conscious work, not behaving mechanically. And here I might say that the most deceived men or women are those who always say, parrot fashion, 
that they always consider others and put them first, as if one could mechanically by habit do such a thing, which requires the highest conscious effort constantly, yes, every day, renewed. In beginning to like what you dislike, start with the person you know. First, stop disliking, then see for yourself what happens. Now take yourself. You have quarreled with someone. What is the solution? Where are you going to start from if you really wish to work consciously? With the other person? Certainly not. It is your fault. So start with yourself. What is wrong with you? Not with the other person. The solution lies with and in yourself. In this work, everything must be turned the other way round. It is you, not the other. So long as a person sees the solutions of his troubles, only in new arrangements of people, in others, in things, he will be negative. As a result, his mind will be dead. That is, he will not be able to think aright. Negative emotions prevent the mind from working rightly. Instead, a person indulges in negative recriminations, which is not thinking. Is it not extraordinary how people spend their lives in vague negative recriminations? No, one must begin with oneself in all one's own troubles. Start from what you take as you and observe this thing you take so glibly as you yourself. Do not start with the person whom you think to be the source of your misery. Then you will see how the work is like that esoteric myth of Perseus, who had to slay the Gorgon of hatred and all negativeness, who, if you looked once at her, turned you to stone. So Perseus, by looking at her with a mirror, that is, the other way round, and so seeing her in himself, slew her and released from her Pegasus, the horse, which means in esoteric symbolism, the mind on which he mounted. <laughs>